Good, Ryan. Okay. Okay, so thanks again, guys, for joining in today. We're going to tackle a huge topic. It, this was a tough one for me to keep nice and concise, so I'm going to try and do my best and make it as digestible as possible. Because neck pain is incredibly broad, right? It can pertain to so many different conditions. But we're going to just focus in on the most common type of neck pain, which is mechanical neck pain. So that's the neck pain that we treat. And that's neck pain relating to the joints, muscles, uh, soft tissues, or nerves in the neck. And this is neck pain in the absence of other conditions. So things that are a little bit more ominous that we're not going to talk about today. Um, we're just talking about mechanical neck pain. So like anything, especially anything relating to the body and pain and injury, the first step to overcoming an injury is, is just simply understanding it. You can get so much out of uh, a little bit of good education and reassurance uh, and feeling in control. I remember just pers on a personal note, struggling with uh, bouts of neck pain, low back pain in my younger years and before going into like my 50 years of school. Uh, I remember that feeling of being afraid and frustrated with what I was feeling. So I just, I can appreciate having a better understanding of what's going on as it pertains to neck pain, especially. Uh, it allows me to feel a little bit more in charge of what's happening and I can take some more control. And it's doing it already. So I'm just having a little bit of trouble switching slides. There we go. So for those of you who we have not met uh, and you are a foundationer or you've come here by another, another route, I'm Ryan. I'm a Cairo at Foundation Physio. I work at the downtown core location on Edward Street and the Corktown location on King Street. So we're going to play a quick little game so you can get to know me. If you've ever played Two Truths and a Lie, uh, all you have to do is guess what the False uh, statement is out of these three, okay? So my favorite food is Thai. Maybe, maybe not. I was born in the US. I love necks. <laughs> so any idea which one is incorrect or false? You can throw it up in the chat. Um, see what you think. Everybody says you love necks. <laughs> <laughs> so love necks, it's true that I love necks. So which one is incorrect? <laughs> Everybody looks like we're seeing, <laughs> your mom's not too sure that Thai food's your favorite. Um, we're so, getting the most votes for, for the USA, yeah. Okay, so that, that was correct. I was not born in the US, born in North York, grew up in Thornhill. I love Thai food. And I love necks, <laughs> which is a really strange thing to hear, I, I bet. But um, as chiros, physios, manual therapists, we, we all tend to have a favorite uh, area of the body that we like to treat. So for me, that's the neck. It always has been. Uh, I, I, from two perspectives, I really love uh, how well the neck responds to some manual therapy. And I also appreciate how sensitive that area is. It's, uh, it's an area that, uh, you know, can be in a lot of pain and people can be uncomfortable with someone um, touching it or working on it. So I can respect that and usually try and find the best way to work through that and keep someone comfortable and uh, reassure them that, you know, the, the neck isn't actually as fragile as we think it is. That's why I love necks. So this is an overview of what we're going to go through today. Uh, we're going to go through some education and then talk about some ways that you can, or some strategies that you can incorporate into your daily routine, daily life, uh, especially if you're someone experiencing neck pain, uh, to help mitigate some of that. Okay, so stats, statistics are pretty boring, but they can really help us to not feel so alone, especially when we're experiencing something like pain. So from the research, we know that 80% of the population at some point in their lifetime will experience neck pain. You're not alone, right? Four in five people uh, will be experiencing neck pain, will feel similar things to you uh, 
uh, though in potentially different uh, experiences. Women tend to experience neck pain more commonly than men. I'm sorry, ladies, um, as if you didn't have enough stuff to deal with, <laughs> you guys got the short end of the stick on that one too. And of those 80% of people, almost half on average will tend to experience neck pain each year. So it's something that can pop up in your life and it's also something that can pop up regularly in your life too. Uh, so again, just, just reinforcing that you are not alone in experiencing this. It's very common. <clears throat> the great news is most people are able to continue on with their daily life without interruption. So the neck pain can be there in the background and be really annoying. Um, but for the most part, it's not something that truly interferes with their life. A small percentage of people, the research says 2 to 11% of people experiencing neck pain may actually have um, aspects of their life where there's interference or impairment. Uh, like a best example of that is not being able to check your blind spot when you're uh, in your car. So the odds are in your favor, Katniss Everdeen. So where are we talking about? Where is the neck? <laughs> I, I, it sounds kind of silly, but uh, we think of the neck anatomically as the space between our head and our shoulders or our torso. I just uh, drew it a little thing here with my Apple pencil, which I'm kind of obsessed with these days. But neck pain can refer to other places that we may not have necessarily thought of when we think of neck pain. So neck pain can refer up into the head, into the scalp, into the ears, into the jaw. Uh, it can refer into the area, if you can see the point here, which we typically refer to as the shoulders, like in, in passing. But as practitioners, we still tend to refer to this area as the neck. And also into the mid-back, we can talk about uh, how that's related to the neck as well. And lastly, if you are experiencing anything in the neck that's relating to the nerves that are coming out of your neck, a lot of those nerves end up exiting and going into your arms and hands. So neck pain may sometimes be associated with symptoms in your arms and hands. Sorry, Ryan, just before you move on, we had a question yeah, um, from Carol. Uh, do you know why women experience more neck pain? Is there, does, is there a reason that you've, you've found when you're researching this? It, 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 would, it would more so just be kind of theoretical, like hypotheses. Uh, the, one, the one thing that comes up, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later on, has to do with uh, neck flexor endurance strength. Uh, or neck flexor endurance. So we're going to talk about some of the muscles in the neck and they just tend to be a little bit weaker in women compared to men, um, biological uh, gender. Uh, but other than that, we, we don't really know. It can sometimes have to do with uh, job demands uh, and we're going to touch on that as well. But that's the best I've got for you. Okay, but great question. Thank you. Okay, so let's take a look under the hood. So it's not so much of a mystery. I just wanted to point out a couple structures, not to get into too much detail, but when we look at the neck, we have the vertebra. So the bones in the spine that make up uh, that area of the spine of the neck is the cervical vertebra. We have seven of those and they connect to each other with, um, by facet joints. So these joints right in here, and each of these facet joints is um, covered by a joint capsule and they connect each bone in the spine or in the in the neck to each other as well as the discs. So the discs are these little shock absorbers that sit in between each bone in the spine and um, <clears throat> they can, uh, it, we're going to get into it, but they can also be uh, something that we consider when we talk about neck pain. And the last picture here, just to give you an idea of all the nerves that are popping out of the neck in this region, there's so much going on and it helps us really understand a little bit more about why we could potentially feel pain in other areas of the head or the neck, uh, because a lot of these nerves end up exiting from the spine along these areas uh, of the neck. So lots going on there. What hurts? Everyone wants to know what is causing my pain, right? What structures are involved? Why am I experiencing this pain? What is going on underneath, right? So 
the, the real, the real answer is we can't always tell you, we can't always identify the pain generator. So what structures are actually <clears throat> contributing to why you're feeling pain? We know from research and studies for the most part that the facet joints, so those joints we talked about connecting each bone in the spine to each other, uh, are usually involved in some way, shape or form. Uh, and we know that, uh, from testing, but we also can understand that there's a lot of nerve supply going into those facet joints. So there's a lot of nerves going into those joints, sending messages and information up to the brain to tell the brain where the head is in space, right? Because the neck is holding up the head and the head is holding up a very important piece of machinery. So the brain wants to have that information. So there's a lot <clears throat> of innervation or nerve fibers in there, and that can help us understand a little bit, mo bit more why uh, things can go south so quickly, right? So the facet joints can typically be involved, and then the discs, which we talked about as well, could potentially be involved, and the muscles. Those are usually the more common pain um, generators, but again, we don't always know, and that's okay. We know from lots of research and clinical experience that we don't necessarily need to know what um, structures are involved in the neck to help you feel better. We do know that function is way more important than structure in this case. We want to have a better understanding of what you can or can't do and improve upon that. Those are the, the rules of rehab and healing is following function. So structure isn't as important in this case. This is a cool map just to demonstrate what I was talking about before, how neck pain can be present in other areas of the body that we don't necessarily consider to be the anatomical neck. So these numbers and letters just correspond to the levels of the vertebra in the neck and where some of those uh, nerves come out and joints are present. So you can see that pain in the neck could uh, send some referral pain all the way down into the middle of the shoulder blades in some points out across to the ends of the sh what we talk about as the shoulder here. Uh, so it can move in lots of different places. So interesting to understand that. Uh, a point to make is just because you have pain in the middle of the shoulder blade doesn't necessarily mean that it's coming from the neck. A good physical assessment would help figure out if that's the case. Okay, neck pain does not usually act alone. Uh, sometimes it does, but it has friends, friends that we don't like. Uh, headaches can be a component with neck pain, uh, especially if we're talking about cervicogenic headaches. So cervicogenic headaches are specific headaches that are actually, uh, their cause is because of aggravation or irritation to structures in the neck. So headaches can be correlated with neck pain. Stiffness can be present with neck pain. Back pain, so pain in other areas of the spine could be associated with neck pain. We talked about before how if uh, nerves that are exiting the spine from the neck that are going into the arms and hands are somehow impacted, we can experience symptoms there. And then dizziness is an, another uh, associated symptom that we don't always think about. But again, if we, if we go back to what I was mentioning before with the nerves that are supplying those facet joints, that are telling the brain information about where our head is in space. If that information is muffled or not getting to the brain in the correct way, we can experience dizziness because it's helping with our, um, our proprioceptive system. So our system that tells us where we are. Next question, why is this happening to me? What did I do, right? We all wanna know that. This is like the most common quote I hear in practice is I think I slept weird so why is this happening to me what is causing my neck pain right and I want to reiterate we're just talking about non-traumatic neck pain so we're not talking about neck pain that result that resulted uh, from a car accident or things like that because we have a better understanding of the mechanism right we know why you're feeling the pain this is a traumatic or non-traumatic neck pain could posture be a cause yep Totally, right? If we, we're gonna dive into it a little bit deeper uh, in the coming slides, but it could definitely be a cause. Sleep position, yeah, potentially, sometimes. Muscle weakness, which we're also gonna dive into. 
could be a contributor. Exercise, so overloading, so doing too much more than your body was ready to handle, potentially could create neck pain. Uh, your work, so your job demands. Do you have something that, uh, do you have a job that requires you to perform lots of strenuous uh, activities? Or on the opposite spectrum, do you have a job where you have to stay sedentary and sitting for long periods of time, right? Which we can all relate to. Texting, yeah, maybe. Stress, definitely a component. Uh, especially, again, now more relevant because we are just in such a crazy time, so uncertain. And I'm sure people are probably noticing an uptick in their neck pain as a result of increased stress. So just knowing that that's normal, but it, it could potentially be a cause. So all of these, all of these things on the list could be contributors, but the, the real answer is there's no one cause. There's no one reason why you're having neck pain. It's usually multifactorial and that's going to look different for each individual person. So that's why it's really good to get an assessment by a professional to understand and do some detective work as to why you personally are experiencing your neck pain. Is it because of weakness? Is it maybe more related to posture? Is it more related to what you're doing at work? So like taking all these things into account and figuring out how to best approach it, we need to consider lots of different factors. Cool. Okay. So again, I want to stick to what we know right? And what we know is based on lots of hardworking people uh, do a lot of really great research. So what we know about neck pain, a lot of what we know is based on the foundations created by the Neck Pain Task Force. So this was a group of interna an international group of over 50 doctors and researchers that uh, partnered with the United Nations, and they published dozens of studies and reviews on neck pain. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on a lot of their findings, some of which I've already discussed. But if you were interested in reading more on this, just message me and I can email you some of the uh, studies. But this is some great stuff. And this helps us understand what is going to work with neck pain and what necessarily isn't going to work. So let's talk about that according to the best evidence. So what works with neck pain? Education. Numero uno. So this is something that we are doing in this present moment. So pat on the back to all of you for being here and learning a bit more, right? I mentioned before the first step to overcoming anything in this kind of realm is just really having a better understanding of it, right? When we understand something a little bit more in depth, it becomes less uh, worrisome, less fearful. Uh, so education, a huge uh, important thing that we need to consider when figuring out how to best treat neck pain, right? Manual therapy, manipulation, things that uh, we do in practice all the time and the evidence says uh, can be very helpful in treating non-complicated neck pain. So improving um, range of motion, reducing pain, and minimizing disability all things that they found in their research. Acupuncture, another tool that, again, the evidence supports the use of for neck pain. So all things that you would potentially come to foundation physio for, which is pretty fun. Uh, what doesn't work, according to the evidence? So I always, I always laugh at these pictures because these people are always so happy when they are wearing braces. It's just the craziest thing. <laughs> anyway. Uh, collars, immobilizing. We, the evidence does not support the use of this for uh, non-traumatic neck pain. So this could actually, in fact, delay prognosis or delay how, um, how fast you are going to be able to get better by immobilizing. So we want to stay away from uh, collars and immobilizing and save that for uh, specific situations like trauma and uh, pathological uh, fractures or other things that we're not going to talk about right now. Okay, what else does the evidence say? What doesn't work? Steroid injections. And again, this is based on the research done. Steroid injections, um, Botox injections, according to the evidence, are not advised for treating neck pain. Okay. Anti-inflammatories. So anti-inflammatories, the conclusion that they found was uh, not that they advise against it, but there's not enough evidence to support the use of it. 
So that doesn't mean that you can't use it. It just means that you would want to consult with your doctor, um, medical professional, and determine if the uh, determine the benefits and the risks and whether or not this was the right thing for you. Last but not least, one of my favorites that I love to talk about because it can be a very confusing subject still for the public and for the medical uh, or healthcare community is imaging. So when we talk about imaging, I'm referring to x-ray or MRI. And really, based on the evidence, what we know is that imaging the neck does not necessarily help us better understand or explain your neck pain. And I get it. It's human nature to really want to understand what's going on. Like, why am I feeling this? Where is it coming from? But the evidence says that what we find on x-ray or MRI actually could go the other way. It could, it, it could sometimes make things more complicated. And we can start to put blame on structures that we see in the neck um, that maybe look like they could be causing pain but aren't actually in reality. So just know the evidence says that imaging in this case isn't supported. I'm just going to wait for this slide to change. Sorry about the lag, people. Come on. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about some things to give you a better understanding of neck pain. We've discussed some things that can help with neck pain from a provider standpoint, so things that I could do or Matt could do. But let's talk about some things that you can do to help mitigate or minimize your experience with neck pain, okay? So we're gonna go over a few different points. I'm gonna start with the lowest hanging fruit. And again, like some of this stuff is gonna seem very basic and elementary, but it, it's, it, it's those things that require the most reinforcement and reiteration. Number one, sleeping. Sleeping is for anything, is the time that we recover and heal. It's also, um, something that we see in relation to pain science we know that people who are deprived of sleep or are lacking sleep are going to experience heightened levels of pain compared to people who are getting normal sleep so if you're someone who's experiencing neck pain and not getting enough sleep this is something that we want to prioritize right and you would if you're having troubles with this you would reach out to the right professional to help guide you through some ways to improve upon that Managing stress, right? So again, we talked about how this can be relevant at any time, but potentially even more relevant to a lot of people during this time. Um, we, we always talk about how we manifest stress in our shoulders and our neck. We don't really understand why. I'm going to get into one point a little bit later on as to maybe why that's so. Uh, but making sure that you're managing this and certain ways to manage this um, are really just some of the things that I'm going to post on this slide today. Uh, but if you're having trouble with this, just reaching out to the right people and making sure that you're addressing it. Another really important topic, uh, general exercise, right? So in rehab, we tend to focus on the specifics, like the rehab exercises for certain areas of the body. But really, what I would want you to prioritize is just getting regular general exercise. So that can look different for everyone. But again, the Canadian physical guidelines recommend getting 150 uh, hour, hours, that would be a lot, 150 minutes of uh, regular exercise per week. So making sure that you're incorporating that because even though you're not necessarily strengthening or working on your neck muscles or the, neck, the muscles that you would think are related to your neck pain, you're still doing a lot of uh, good for what's going on. And the last but not least, good fuel, right? We, we talk about putting food into our bodies and putting bad foods and good foods. We know that there are certain foods that are anti-inflammatory, so they bring down inflammation, and certain foods that are pro-inflammatory, so they, make, uh, they may increase inflammation. So we want to consider what foods are what and try and do our best, especially if we're experiencing neck pain, to uh, put good things in. So posture. Posture is, is a big one. We always talk about it. 
I would, uh, it would be a weird day if someone came into the office and didn't mention something about how their posture sucks or they have shitty posture. Um, so it's definitely something to consider, but it's not the only factor. Like we talked about, neck pain is multifactorial. So there's lots of things to consider. But again, if you are someone who, as if you can see in this picture, if you're someone who sits for long hours at a time like this and doesn't really switch it up, then that may be a time where we consider posture a little bit more heavily, right? So the best way to do that is just switch it up. It's, it's, it's super simple. I like to kind of frame it in a way where you can think about if you're working at home, a three position cycle. So this is even easier to do from home because you have a little bit more freedom on where you can set up your workplace, right? If you're working from a laptop or a computer. Um, so I would say pick three spots where you can work, on the couch, maybe at your desk, and then maybe at your kitchen counter. And shuffling through those positions, let's say um, through a cycle of every hour, switching through those positions and continuing to shift through those so that you're um, not putting excess strain on certain structures or tissue and you're giving your body time to uh, kind of recover from some of those positions that you were holding for long periods of time. So just really considering that posture isn't necessarily the, the demon here, but the lack of switching up your posture. Okay. Come on. It's gonna jump like four slides ahead now. Yeah, of course it did. Okay, sorry about that. Consider the mid back, right? So we, we focus a lot on the area that we're talking about, right? When we're talking about neck pain, we're looking at the neck, but we also have to consider some of the areas close to that area, right? So the mid back, again, is another area of the spine. The spine is one structure. The neck is part of it. The mid back is part of it too. So from ex clinical experience, a lot of us physios and chiros find that patients or people that are experiencing neck pain tend to have stiffer or uh, stiffer or less mobility through their mid back or their T spine or their thoracic spine. So this is something that I would prioritize or include in my kind of gamut of things that I'm working on to help improve upon my neck pain. So here's just two uh, really great but basic examples on ways to mobilize my mid back, right? So the first one is the cat cow. So I'm on all fours, flexing, pushing up the mid back towards the ceiling and then extending down to the floor. So we're getting good flexion extension through the mid back and then thread the needle. So thread the needle, we're working on rotation from the mid back. Um, and if you're looking for better direction on this, you can just Google thread the needle or you can ask one of us how that looks in real time. <clears throat> so just remember, consider the mid back. Uh, the neck is important, but the mid back can also be part of what's going on. So this is one of my favorites, and this is something that people don't always consider or think about when we're talking about neck pain. Um, when we talk about breathing, you're just probably like, okay, I know how to breathe. I'm doing it right now. Uh, what happens though, over time, as we age, like if you look at a baby, they breathe just super efficiently. As we age, we tend to stop relying as much on our diaphragm, which is that big muscle that sits under our chest cavity above our abdomen, right? And that muscle is responsible for pulling air into the lungs and pushing it back out. It's a very strong, powerful muscle and it should be the primary breathing muscle. Our secondary breathing muscles are muscles in our rib cage and actually muscles in our neck connecting the top of our rib cage to, uh, to our head and to our neck. So, with stress, with sitting postures, lots of different things, we tend to start to use our secondary breathing muscles a little bit more than our diaphragm. And if you think about that logically, if we're putting more stress and strains through some of those neck muscles when we shouldn't be, that could potentially be a contributor as to why we're experiencing neck pain. So the best way to work on that is to simply practice diaphragmatic breathing. So to go through that really quickly right now, I, I prefer you to do this lying down, but for now I'm just gonna demonstrate while I'm sitting. And you wanna have one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly. So the objective here is to bring the air in 
and push your belly out and expand your belt line while keeping your rib cage and your chest and your shoulders nice and still. So you're only using your diaphragm for that breath in and then the belly's coming back in to expel the air and you exhale. So keeping the chest, the rib cage nice and still and really trying to utilize the diaphragm instead. So again, like anything, uh, this is just something that takes practice. The diaphragm is a muscle and it just needs to be exercised at, in that way and then can eventually become a little bit more involuntary. So you can do it more subconsciously as opposed to relying on your neck muscles and your ribcage muscles. Cool. Every time I stop moving this mouse, it pauses and freezes. So just give me one sec and it jumped ahead. Okay. So next point, second last point I'm going to go through is something I had briefly touched on at the beginning. We talked about muscle weakness contributing to neck pain. So this is actually one of the better studied interventions or connections in neck pain is looking at the deep neck flexors and their endurance. So the deep neck flexors uh, are muscles, as it sounds, deep in our neck along the spine portion of our neck. And you can think about them the same way you would think about your core muscles, right? When we're talking about low back pain, um, we're talking about those muscles and strengthening them and getting them more activated so that they create more stability in the low back. Same thing goes for the neck. We need to we need to reclaim better endurance in these deep neck flexor muscles. So how do we know how our neck flexors are doing or our deep neck flexors are doing? We go through an endurance test. So this is something again that I would prefer someone who knows what they're doing watch you do because you want to make sure that you're not cheating. There's ways that you can compensate while testing yourself for this and not actually be relying on your deep neck flexors. So just going through this video, you're lying on your back, chin comes down towards the floor, and you're just slightly lifting your head off the uh, table or the floor, like about an inch. And we're looking to see how long you can hold this comfortably without pain. Typically healthy women can hold this for an, on an average for 29 seconds, and healthy men, 38 seconds. So again, I mentioned before, the research tells us that people who have neck pain tend to have shorter hold times than people who are not experiencing neck pain. So how do we strengthen these? One way is simply to do the test. So we would just switch it up a little bit instead of uh, trying to hold it for as long as we, we can. We are creating endurance holds. So everyone's going to be a little bit different depending on your abilities, but you may end up doing this for three to four seconds at a time or seven to eight seconds at a time and going to a reasonable level of fatigue to work on this. But that would, that would require a little bit more direction from someone. Okay, so we're considering the deep neck flexors as something you can definitely do to help improve your neck pain. And last but not least, um, if you guys watched my hip webinar, I touched on the idea of hygiene for your joints. So the same way that you would brush your and floss your teeth each day, hopefully, um, you would want to take care of your joints because your joints were designed to move and they really require that motion. So if we're sitting all day staring at our computer and we haven't really encouraged the exploration of our range of motion, if we haven't used our joints in their full capacity, then we're doing them a disservice. And we really want to look at this from a hygienic perspective. So we can apply the same thing we talked about with the hip to the neck as well. Um, CARS stands for controlled articular rotations. And in English, that just means moving your joints in their entire range of motion. So let's go through that right now. I'm just going to come off of the screen share for a sec so you can see me in a bigger view, uh, hopefully. I'm just going to move back a little bit. So when we're doing controlled articular rotations in the neck, all you're gonna think about is incorporating all the directions of range of motion, but doing it in a, in a comfortable way. So we don't wanna be pressing into pain. If you're feeling pinching or pain in certain positions, then that's telling you you gotta back off a bit and work within what you feel comfortable with. 
And if you are having consistent pain in some of those areas and it's not getting better, then that would be a time where you'd want to reach out to us and we could do a little bit more detective work and digging as to why you're having trouble in those positions. So the way we start is bringing the chin down to your chest as best you can. And we're going to roll our chin across our collarbone if we can touch it into full rotation. We're then going to tip the head over into lateral flexion or side bending. And then we're gonna explore extension. And we're doing this slow and comfortable. And then we're side bending to the left, rotating fully to the left. And then again, dragging our, our chin across our left collarbone, coming back to that midpoint. And then going back the same way you came. Right, and we're really trying to explore what our range is. We're trying to use all available range in this movement. Okay? So if you have more questions about going through controlled articular rotations, we can definitely talk about it. But uh, again, it's not, it's, it, it's not uncommon to feel sticking points or pain in some of these positions, especially That's if you haven't done it for a while. That's exactly what somebody just threw in the chat. They, uh, somebody was just asking if it's, if it's bad, if they feel pain with that. Yeah. So, so I, again, w without, without knowing that particular person and what's going on, I, I couldn't make a judgment call and say that's bad or not bad. Um, I wouldn't be overly concerned, but it just may be something that you want to address uh, with a practitioner. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to jump back into the screen share. So consider movement hygiene, all right? Brushing your teeth, doing your controlled articular rotations. So let's just summarize everything we've talked about, okay? Because we talked about quite a bit. So remember to prioritize your sleep, manage your stress as best you can, Re reach out for help if you need to. That's a really important one. Uh, get some general exercise throughout the week. Don't forget about that. That's, again, something that doesn't have to be specific to your neck, just to your overall um, cardiovascular health, mental health, et cetera. And try to eat decently. Switch up your postures, right? We don't want to demonize any one posture. We just want to have a lot of variety or variation. Try and work on mobilizing your T-spine. That can potentially be a contributor as to why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. So I would definitely consider working on that. Think about breathing, uh, using your diaphragm and not your neck and shoulder muscles. Work on strengthening your deep neck flexor muscles. Move hygienically, regularly. Cool. So again, just to close, there really is no one pill product, service, tool that's going to cure you of your neck pain. I'm sorry to uh, burst the bubble there. Um, but what the research does tell us is that a multimodal approach is the best way to go to manage experiences with neck pain. So all that means is two or more types of interventions, right? So we've talked about quite a few interventions in this, um, in this presentation. And what we usually see in these kinds of studies is the combination approach trumps the singular approach. Okay, so think about all those sorts of things. You may have difficulty incorporating all of them at once. I think anyone would have trouble doing that, but just starting to think about some of the things we talked about, especially if you're someone who's um, experiencing neck pain, right? And everyone's neck pain situation is unique and different combinations or different combinations of approaches um, may be needed, right? So treating one person, your friend may not be the same as treating you. <clears throat> and, oh God, I love Michael Jordan right now. He's so cool. Okay, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Apologies again. So that concludes the neck pain, understanding neck pain presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think now would be a, great time to kind of talk about some things if they've come up through the presentation. Ryan, do you mind taking off the screen share for a second? Yeah, absolutely.
Perfect. There we go. Okay. So we had a couple questions on sleeping in pillows. So yes, what would be a good way to sleep for neck pain? And then uh, of course the follow-up question is what type of pillow is best for the neck when sleeping? Mm -hmm. That's a, who, who, who said that? So we had one from Simona and one from Carol. Simona, Carol, thank you for your questions. You're unfortunately really not going to like my answer. <laughs> I apologize in advance. It, it really does depend, right? Like I, I mentioned before, everyone's neck pain situation is going to be a little bit unique. So it's really hard. This is, this is something that I've found through clinical experience. It's really hard for me to say, yes, everyone go out and buy the ND pillow. It's going to be the best pillow for your neck pain or go buy this orthopedic pillow. It's going to be the best. It's unfortunately not the case. And I would be doing a disservice if I didn't say that. Uh, it's it's going to be a little bit of trial and error. What I would say is typically neck pain likes to, um, neck pain likes back sleepers and side sleepers, I would say, overall, as opposed to stomach sleepers. It tends to put the neck in a really awkward position. And sometimes you can kind of jam those facet joints that we talked about, those joints interlocking each bone in the spine to each other. Um, but it's really going to be a little bit of trial and error. So I, I, it's, it's hard for me to recommend a specific pillow or um, a specific way to sleep. But I, I would generalize and say that those are kind of the topics that you want to hit. And um, making sure that your neck is in the best possible neutral position. So if we think about lying on a pillow, if we're lying on too high of a pillow or too thick of a pillow, we could potentially be putting our neck in this flexed position right? Which we don't want. We want to have it in somewhat of a neutral position. So thinking about pillow height can be really helpful. And that pillow height is going to change depending on whether you're lying on your back or lying on your side. Because if you're lying on your side, you're going to need to fill this space between your shoulder and your head so that you're not doing a weird kink, right? So again, I'm sorry, it's not the best answer, but it, it, it's uh, if you look at some of those points, it, it potentially could be helpful. A lot of people saying thank you for the information. A lot of people saying My they're going to continue. Pleasure. They're going to add the uh, cars into their their daily routines while they're at home. Love it. And um, I also posted on my YouTube channel. If you just search Ryan Albert on YouTube, I posted a neck mobility series a few weeks back, and we can link that out to you guys as well if you want to. Uh, check that out. Just some exercises to help address um, some strengthening in the neck. Mm -hmm. Okay. And well fit coach Simi or Simone says uh, a good tip would also be to roll up a small towel to fill in that space between the neck and the shoulder when laying on your side. Yeah, definitely. Well. Definitely. Thanks Simone. Yeah. That, that, and anything you can do to kind of, to create a little bit more neutrality, I would say could be helpful. It's not mm -hmm. the be all end all, but it's something mm -hmm. to consider for sure. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. Um, I just want to say that I'm really disappointed that nobody noticed that you and I have the same mustache beard combination right now. <laughs> nobody noticed that. And I'm, I'm really sad. About I just that. can't, I can't connect. <laughs> I can't connect. I know. So I, I, I went to, I went to yours now. I went with the no, or nice. the disconnected one too. I, I wanted to fit in with I you. Didn't, for this. I didn't do that purposely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to jump back into the, to the screen share for a sec, just to hit one more point. If we're done with questions. Um, so again, thanks for joining in guys. I really appreciate it. Oh, we have last one last, one last question, Ryan, just yeah, before we get to that. Um, Morgan asks, She's wondering about if, we, if you have an opinion on physical manipulation in the neck. Yeah, I mean, so as a chiropractor, this is, this is something that's, I would, a lot of people will consider our bread and butter, right? Uh, as chiropractors, one of, the, one of the forms of treatment that we practice or utilize the most is manipulation. So what manipulation really is without dragging on too long is we're taking joints, those facet joints in the neck, and we're just temporarily gapping them. And that gives some time for gas to escape the joint. That's all we're doing. We're not moving bones. We're not doing anything scary or weird. And like mentioned, 
in the in the presentation before manipulation after tons and tons of research has been demonstrated to be a really great way to treat neck pain so again i understand there are a lot of people um, are hesitant to have their necks manipulated and i would never recommend doing something that you don't feel comfortable with um, but just understanding that the procedure itself is actually very safe um, amidst what you may have heard about it if you have more questions about it i don't want to take up too much time but i'd be happy to explain it in depth um, at another point yeah if i can just jump in on that one too yeah. ryan i mean um, research has shown that it's even if you're having manipulation and not just mobilization done at the neck mm -hmm. it's still as safe or safer than taking painkillers uh, ibuprofen and stuff like that yeah. um, in, in in a short term it's much safer uh, for your body um, as long as you're with a a therapist who's competent in what they know what they're doing um, it's very safe and a very effective at least um, temporary tool in neck yeah. pain relief yeah I agree hundred percent yeah so that's but that's a great question I, I really appreciate that um, and then somebody just asked is self cracking the neck not forcefully just through stretching okay yeah that's a, that's another great question uh, again what you're doing when you're hearing that popping sound is you're taking a joint and you're just bringing it slightly beyond its uh, its range of motion enough so that it can gap temporarily so when you're hearing that kind of cavitation sound that popping sound it's not something that's unsafe or unwelcome it doesn't cause arthritis uh, from what we know uh, I, we can't really make any any calls as to whether or not it's safe I just I would say that it's not something I would worry about or worry about any of my patients doing um yeah matt do you have anything to touch on with that no i think that's just um again we don't know exactly what's happening in the joint it's it's fairly impossible to know that but um yeah. just from you know clinical experience it's probably more likely that um, it's no different than when you stand up out of a chair and your ankles crack yeah it, it's it's not dangerous unless there's some sort of um acute pain um, and sharp mm. pain really associated with it. And more than likely we're going through some bit of, you know, something sticking in the joint or some scar tissue or gas escaping. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say that if, if that's something that you're doing habitually because you need to get that release, it could be because there's other things going on that we need to address, mm -hmm. right? Like instability or weakness or motor control, things like that. So there may be a reason behind why you feel like you have to continually do it. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. If it's a continual thing and if it's a daily thing, there's mm -hmm. probably more of a strengthening component that we have to look into for the reason why it continues to catch like that. Yeah. Great question, so. Okay, I'll let you finish up. I think that was our last question. Beauty. So the last thing I just wanted to mention, guys, while I have you here is, you know, while we continue to transition back to real life, and hopefully uh, Premier Ford has some good news for us today, um, don't let questions or issues fall to the wayside right now. You know, we, we are here for you. Virtual care is here to stay. It's been here for a while. Uh, I just wanted to pull up uh, for you a systematic review. So a systematic review is, is kind of our highest level or one of our highest levels of evidence. It takes a lot of studies and puts them together. And this is something from 2017 that said, telecare or telerehabilitation for treatment of musculoskeletal conditions is effective and comparable to standard practice. So in case you were concerned about whether or not we could actually help you or do anything through telehealth, you know, there, there's a lot to be said about uh, working virtually. So my link is down there. You can always reach us through our website through whatever social media platform you hang out on. And yeah, just don't be afraid to reach out. And that's it. Awesome, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, again, um, you know, if you need to refer back to it, you can always check out our YouTube channel. Uh, just search Foundation Physiotherapy uh, on YouTube. And like Ryan mentioned, he's available right now for any sort of virtual content uh, and consults. And fingers crossed, we'll be back open in a physical sense 
in about uh, a week and a half, two weeks, uh, based on what we're hearing. So stay tuned for that. Um, and again, if you found this information, you know, interesting, feel free to share it with uh, your friends and family, right? Share those links with them. And uh, I know Ryan would appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks All again, right, guys. guys. Really appreciate your time. Have a good Hope Thursday, everybody. Away from this. Yeah. Take care.